So, uh, yeah, one of the things that's happening is that uh, astronomy was conventionally done in uh, broadly what we'll call institutes. So these are mm-hmm. uh, you know, roughly the equivalents of places like Carnegie or the national labs in US, uh, which uh, have say only PhD programs and they have researchers and so on. And now it is spreading out to all of these uh, teaching institutes, IITs, ISERs, universities and so on. Uh, and that is where all the undergraduate student pool is. Ah, so uh, you're so, finding that, that so, more students are able so to So now do students research. actually have access to research because otherwise what they would have to do is wait for a summer or a winter program, um, go to these places, you know, the uh, LIGO India Partner Institutes, for example, several of the early partners are all research-based centers, IUCA, mm-hmm. ICTA, mm-hmm. STIFR and so on. And now you have IITs and ICERs as partners, which are these huge undergraduate pools. And that is where we are getting all these good research students. Good. Um, and actually over the past couple of years already, several of our students have moved into uh, graduate schools um, in gravitational waves um, a- across the world. Sure. Um, in fact, uh, one of my early students will get his PhD next month. Okay. Um, so, uh-huh. so we are now coming full circle with undergraduate involvement. That's as well. good. Yeah, and um, that really builds up the community then. Uh, exactly. For the next generation yes. of researchers. And and those are the people who we are going to need to actually you know handle the screwdrivers and assemble uh, like oh, India and yes. get it working and. A plus and 3G and everything that yeah. those are those are the students. Yeah, there's the lots workforce. to be done over the next yeah. several years and uh, probably the next few decades. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so tell us tell us a bit about yourself, uh, Peter. It's it's great to be talking to you again. Um, so, where are you based? What do you work on? What are your main interests? So, I'm a professor at the University of Maryland in College Park, Maryland, USA. And um, I'm a professor of physics. Uh, We have a physics program and an astronomy program, but uh, gravitational wave detection with ground-based detectors is in the physics department at at my university. Uh, And so this has been my research specialty for just about 20 years now. Um, I didn't start out doing gravitational waves. My training as a graduate student in physics was in experimental particle physics. So I did, an experiment at Fermi Lab uh, near Chicago when I was a graduate student. Um, and that was an exciting time. I learned a lot and uh, did a lot of work on, um, you know, so a lot of hands on work on, on scintillator detectors and mm-hmm. trigger electronics and software for reconstructing tracks, all of the, the, the really important uh, low level things that uh, okay. are, you need to, to make an experiment work. Um, then when, it was, when I was finishing my PhD, uh, I had to decide what to do next. And actually my PhD advisor, Bruce Winstein, uh, suggested that I look at LIGO. Uh, okay. It was something he was interested in. And, um, and s- at, at this time, did LIGO as a facility exist? I mean, were Hanford and Livingston in place? At well, time? partly. The, uh, this was uh, 1990, and so the LIGO project was funded. Okay. The observatory sites were built and um, were, were largely built, but they were still um, doing the installation of the detectors. So kind of a stage where LIGO India is uh, around now or will be in Yeah, a little later and a few, okay. yeah, in a couple of years, a couple more years, uh, LIGO India when there's a, a facility and the arms are laid out okay. and the, you know, the, the beam tubes are in place, but ah, there's nothing okay. installed for lasers and detectors okay. yet. That was kind of the stage where I joined uh, LIGO. And so it was an exciting time because um, the, there was, you know, there was this great potential and also the great challenge to do something that had not been done before and to really uh, explore this new area. And so that's what really attracted me to it. Uh, I could have stayed and done similar in, in particle physics and done similar research to what I'd done as a graduate student, but it was just an exciting opportunity and a good time to join. So um, what, what other fields were you thinking of? I mean. Um, was was there uh, something else that drew you to LIGO over uh, maybe some other areas of physics? I think it was really just the challenge. Okay. The, the fact that um, there, this was something that um, needed a lot of attention to figure out how to do this, you know, how to, to collect the data, how to analyze the data. Uh, that was my, my uh, primary involvement became my primary involvement. It was data analysis methods and tools. I also did some installation and some detector monitoring and so on, um, but all leading into collecting the data that is then analyzed. Okay. 
So um, you you just made a, a very uh, interesting point here. You said that for your PhD, you were working on all the small things that are needed to get an experiment going. Now, often when um, when students are interested in physics, and especially for uh, uh, you know very exciting field like gravitational waves, it's very common for us to hear uh, from students that oh i really want to understand black holes and mm-hmm. um, you know they are often interested more towards theoretical pursuits and so on uh, so for a uh, you know a really large and very ambitious project like ligo um, you know what what are the different components that go in and what are the kind of skills that a person would require to actually um, you know, come into this project and uh, uh, make an impact in it. Right, well, there are really a lot of things. And I think you're right that um, the big motivation is to understand, you know, the biggest powerful events in the universe, black holes, uh, neutron stars, the evolution of the, the structure of the universe and so on. And those are the science topics that we're addressing. But to get there requires a lot of care in, um, constructing these amazingly sensitive detectors and really taking uh, care to um, solve all the the noise problems that pop up, to um, find ways to calibrate them and to check the calibration and so on. And so that's the kind of, that's that's an important, uh, that's a critical part of science. And I think that almost everybody who is involved in LIGO um, has some, have some specialty or specialties that they've uh, contributed to um, the detailed work that it, it takes to do the, this kind of research. Um, in some cases, it's to make the detectors work. Uh, in some cases, it's um, the data analysis algorithms. And in other cases, it's things that you might not associate it so directly, but are really important, like um, uh, using uh, high-powered computing clusters and um, and uh, uh, software, t- um, you know, methods for distributing jobs and for uh, <laughs> um, th- for collecting the results and so on. Uh, so all of this is important to getting the science done. So so when we um, when we say LIGO scientific collaboration, or for example, uh, one metric of that, though not the only metric, would be the co-authors on a LIGO paper. Right. Um, so would that include all the people that you just talked about, uh, the software people, the hardware people, the theorists and data analysis? Yes, we take a, a very inclusive approach to uh, having the authors on our paper listed because of all the people who are bringing different um, different capabilities, you know, different expertise to the project. Well, and when I started, you know, I did not have a background in gravitational waves or in general relativity theories, the things you might expect for someone doing research in gravitational waves. My my experience was in uh, detectors, uh, scintillator detectors, mm-hmm. which we don't use in LIGO, but you know, I had yes. worked with electronics and detectors, um, high-speed trigger electronics, uh, software, um, skills that I developed for one project that were not exactly what was needed for the for LIGO, but you know, the general expertise was something I could contribute. Okay. So uh, starting from your experimental background, and you now said that you're mainly into data analysis. So could you elaborate a bit more on what um, you're currently uh, working on uh, in terms of uh, LIGO? So my interest, um, my primary interest is in the multi-messenger astronomy that we can do with gravitational waves together with other um, other astronomical observations. So with uh, conventional telescopes in the optical band or infrared ultraviolet, so light in, in just outside the visible band, but also in the energetic astronomy that we can um, look at using gamma rays and x-rays. So uh, what kind of work do you do in these areas now? Uh, because, um, you know, gravitational waves, of course, have nothing to do with the electromagnetic spectrum directly. Right. Um, they're a very different kind of wave, and in 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 a broad sense, um, you know, X-rays and everything you could just X-rays, gamma rays, radio, optical. You would all call it as uh, astrophysics in the conventional astrophysics mm-hmm. sense. Everything to do with electromagnetic radiation. So, what's the relation? What do we learn from it? Why do we care? Well, it's it's because it's so different. I mean, for gravitational waves, we're uh, detecting the gravitational influence of mass. So um, the gravitational waves come from motion of large amounts of mass as you would get from 
uh, collapsing stars or from orbiting black holes and neutron stars. And so that is telling us about the, the, the motion of mass which drives the energy, which provides the energy which then can result in an explosion, can result in, in the emission of light or in, in even uh, gamma rays and x-rays. So these other um, astronomy observations are telling us about the flow of energy out from these systems and the gravitational waves tell us about the motion of mass within the systems. So we want to be able to put those together and understand the systems better from the, the comparisons. Um, you just talked about energy outflow from the system. Uh, black holes don't emit light. So what do we expect to see in, um, in electromagnetic radiation from what kind of sources would be of interest? That is, yes, we mostly uh, expect electromagnetic radiation and now we've proven it. Um, from uh, binary neutron stars. So with the detection of the, the first binary neutron star observed in gravitational waves, this was the event uh, GW170817 from 2017, um, we detected the gravitational wave signal that was long expected. But um, amazingly, we also detected a wide range of electromagnetic emissions. And I say amazingly not because it was unexpected that, that neutron stars can produce these, but just that we succeeded in doing this on the first try with the very first event. We had such success in um, getting the word out to the astronomical community that we had detected an, an event and uh, having them be prepared to make observations with telescopes around the world and catch that event from, with many different instruments and in, in many different ways. It was really spectacular. Oh, and um, so apart from binary neutron star mergers, are there any other possible sources of uh, gravitational wave plus electromagnetic wave studies? Sure. So um, supernovae are uh, produced by collapsing stars, and um, the supernova, as it, as it's observed, is a, um, a light. You know, the light that are, that uh, comes from the expanding material that comes from the star. Uh, one of our targets is to look for gravitational waves from the collapse at the center of the core of the star, which drives that supernova, to understand how that collapse occurs and how then the shock um, creates the explosion. This is a, a, an observational challenge because uh, we're not sure how strong the gravitational waves are, but it's something that by having gravitational wave detectors on and monitoring the, the sky at all times, we'll be ready at least for that nearby supernova that may give us this, this piece. And this would actually be the only way of looking at the core of the star as it is exploding because it's hidden behind the thick material outside? Is That's that right, because the supernova, the, the bright op optical signature of the supernova is the outside material, okay. but that's screening out the inside. Um, in, you, you talked about GW170817 and uh, we've, we've heard that it was probably the most extensively observed astronomical source ever. Uh, so can you, can you give people some idea of the scale of the effort and you know, how many people were involved, uh, what kind of things were done, how long did follow up last? Okay, so let's see, it's a long story. Let me try to <laughs> put it into context. We had prepared ahead of time to uh, work with the astronomical community. So uh, even though the LIGO project has not, um, <coughs> let me try to say it this way. Uh, even though the, um, while well, LIGO focuses on gravitational waves pr primarily, we understand that uh, this is in the context of astronomy um, in the broader sense. So we, the LIGO detectors themselves detect uh, just the gravitational waves, which as we've said are completely different from the light um, uh, yeah. and electromagnetic waves. Um, but we had prepared to uh, share information from the gravitational wave detectors with astronomers around the world who were prepared then to follow up those observations and uh, look at, at the sky, at the location that was suggested by the gravitational wave data. In the case of this event in August of 2017, uh, we detected a gravitational wave signal, which was very clearly uh, consistent with a binary neutron star, two, two neutron stars merging. And at the same time, we got word that the Fermi satellite in orbit, um, one of the instruments on that satellite, had detected a gamma ray burst. A short gamma ray burst, which is the type that we expected would be connected with uh, neutron star mergers. 
So uh, with these twin um, uh, pieces of information that fit together uh, with a picture of two neutron stars, um, uh, we got the word out to uh, over 90 groups of astronomers uh, who had um, you know, asked to receive this information. And um, the majority of those then were able to use their instruments and their telescopes around the world to, uh, to make observations of this event. Um, it was something that developed rapidly over a few days. Um, the, although we had a, or an approximate location in the sky from the Fermi satellite, and then a better location from the gravitational wave detectors, it was still a relatively large area of sky for astronomers to target. Um, but with the right choice of telescopes, uh, astronomers started tiling that area and filling in that, that space to try to look for a counterpart anywhere in that space. And about 11 hours after the event occurred, um, the first detection came in of a, uh, a galaxy with a bright source that had not been there before. Okay. And in fact, that was one of six different projects which all detected this event, this, this counterpart, um, within the space of an hour. Well, so with that, um, so that provided a precise location in a particular galaxy, which goes by the name NGC 4993. Uh, it's a galaxy about 130 million light years away. And uh, there was this very distinct bright uh, point that was seen uh, with the optical telescopes. Um, and this began then a, a, a um, campaign of observing this over time. And it was seen that this was changing very rapidly within the space of hours and, and a few days. It, changed from fairly blue to red to the, just the infrared, um, so, and, it, and it faded, although it became brighter in infrared and then started to fade. So this very rapidly evolving optical source was quite unique. You know, supernovas, supernovae are, um, change their optical brightness, and that's a very interesting signature. But this was changing faster in brightness and in color than any kind of supernova that, that's been observed. At the same time, other instruments uh, were, were put into play. So besides looking at light and uh, uh, infrared uh, you know, uh, light, um, uh, astronomers were observing this with uh, X-ray instruments in orbit um, and looking with radio telescopes on the ground. And at first, nothing was seen in either of those, um, okay. even despite using the, the most uh, sensitive instruments available. Basically, the excitement from this event was motivating astronomers to use all resources available. However, several a week or two later, the X-ray, you know, an X-ray uh, uh, source appeared, and a radio source also appeared uh, in, in imaging uh, this area of the sky in radio waves. So, um, and those uh, point sources, um, which were at the same location, actually continued to brighten for months, for about four months these uh, radio and x-ray counterparts brightened. That's quite surprising. It is, isn't it? Because it was not, um, I mean, it was a faint signal at first, and, but, um, but uh, the, uh, this object, whatever it is, became more visible in x-rays and in radio for a period of four months, and then finally kind of gradually leveled off and, and has been fading since then, but still visible a year or more later. So are people still observing this? Uh, yes, there are some observations hmm. being made. Uh, it's faded in most ways that we would observe it, so it's not visible in optical or infrared light uh, the way it was for some weeks. Um, but uh, it's still a, a source in the sky there that, that you can detect with sufficiently uh, sensitive radio instruments, for instance. That's, that's quite interesting. And uh, so this, uh, I believe, had people from something close to a... Uh, 3,500 astronomers uh, and gravitational wave physicists collaborated That's on this right, project. yeah. Um, because the, the, the gravitational wave community is already more than a thousand scientists, um, and because it involved several dozen teams of astronomers, which each have some number of astronomers, it was a, the overall effort was just uh, stupendous. So um, going forward, uh, how do you think things will be if, uh, if we... Fast forward a few years when uh, we would have LIGO India function right. and we would have a five detector network. Um, how, how many such events would we detect? What do we expect to learn from these kind of things? How, how does uh, our scientific knowledge improve with these? And uh, what would it be a few years down the line? 
Right, well, let me start with the gravitational wave detectors. This is a really exciting time because we've now succeeded in detecting gravitational waves, but we have so far 11 events. And 11 okay. events is enough that we're, you know, we have a, a nice collection. Okay. 10 of those are binary black hole mergers, and one is this binary neutron star merger. Um, we know that we're going to detect many more because we're still improving the detectors, and we're going to be adding more detectors to the network. So when we improve the detectors, we can sense gravitational wave events farther out into the universe, and we'll get many more of those. And by adding more um, detectors to the network, we have a better coverage of the whole sky, and we have better confidence in the events that we detect because they're detected by, by the, all of the detectors in the network. And we get more um, information about each event because we have the different detectors sampling them at, with different orientations. And because of the way the gravitational waves are polarized, uh, the different detectors get different views of that polarization. And um, so that's the great benefit of a network, which, uh, which will include LIGO India when it comes online. So we'll have a better handle on the gravitational wave um, events, and we'll be detecting, um, well, estimates range from, uh, you know, uh, for the binary black holes, we may detect one every couple of days, or we may detect 10 per, uh, you know, 10 per uh, month, uh, 10 per day. Well, uh, um, uh, so it, we don't that know. That would keep people quite busy. Exactly, <laughs> right. Now, binary neutron stars, we won't get as many, but we may de be detecting them on a, you know, a weekly basis, um, if we're really lucky, or at least a monthly basis. So then there's this, um, uh, then the question of how to do the astronomy to go with this, because we can't do the same amount of effort for, uh, for as we did for that uh, first event. But that's okay. In fact, most of these will be farther away and will be not as bright, not as spectacular, but will still be um, visible um, to optical telescopes on the ground and detectable by, by space missions. Uh, and so uh, it will be a really interesting thing to see how um, we kind of settle into a, um, a scientific uh, follow-up of these uh, gravitational wave events that is balanced between the gravitational wave observations and the um, other astronomy observations of the same events. So um, on the same line, uh, but broadening a bit, uh, you know, what, what would you, what to you are the most exciting things that are likely to happen in in gravitational waves and in the associated multi-messenger astronomy over the next uh, five, 10 years. Okay, so to pick um, a few of them, well, really the things that I think personally are, are that I'm most excited mm -hmm. to see, I want to see what more binary neutron star mergers are like, because we have one example, and it was, uh, was very much in agreement with expectations in terms of the masses of the neutron stars and the properties of the system. Uh, and so that was uh, reassuring in a way that our understanding of the, the theory and the astrophysics was pretty good. Uh, there are still some mysteries though. Um, for instance, one of the mysteries is why was a gamma ray burst detected from this event, even though the other observations that we got later on um, gave us a picture that the, um, the axis of event, this event where we normally expect the gamma rays to be emitted was not pointed at us but was pointed off to the side by about 20 degrees. Okay. So in that direction, there was, uh, we believe, a very bright gamma ray burst, but that missed the Earth. So, so something like a bullet was fired somewhere else, but we still felt it. Right. And so the question is, what, what produced the gamma rays that were off axis by 20 degrees uh, that were still detectable? Now, they were not as bright as, as right on the axis, so, but they were detected. Also, the afterglow that I, that I mentioned in X-rays and uh, radio um, that took four months to reach its peak and then leveled off, that kind of slow rise and then peak and slow fall is also consistent with being off axis. But um, we haven't explored how that depends on how far off axis you are. So with more events, we'll have a, a sampling. You know, some of them may be pointed directly at us. Some may be 20 degrees away. 30 degrees away, 50 degrees away. And from looking at this distribution and seeing what the gamma ray and X-ray afterglow and the optical emission are, uh, optical and infrared emission are, um, we'll be learning a lot more about the astrophysics and how it, um, 
it's an asymmetric, you know, expansion of material from the event. That's that's great. It's um, you know, uh, a lot of people share this excitement about this field in general, and of course, we have a lot of students who are now um, highly motivated by these new discoveries and want to. Uh, enter uh, gravitational wave uh, studies or uh, the associated multi-messenger astrophysics and uh, what what would be your advice to these students who are ranging from um, you know uh, bachelor students all the way to phd students what would be um, your suggestions to those right well it's it's exciting and and co constantly in flux but i think that's the advantage for students so i would say to students is um i would tell students Learn about the, um, the, the, the big questions, you know, um, uh, explore what the big questions are, um, and then think about what specific areas, you know, what specific questions um, you would like to uh, explore. Because there are a lot of um, specific puzzles or specific uh, inquiries that uh, are associated with the things that we know, but also a lot of new questions that you could ask. Um, and some of which we didn't know to ask really before we had this event. So each new uh, discovery will also open new questions to be answered. And uh, would, what kind of background would, I mean, so if you're talking of undergraduate students, for example, mm -hmm. what kind of backgrounds would be necessary for this? Are we talking about uh, mathematics, physics, computing, engineering? Uh, what kind of people does the gravitational wave community welcome? It's really a combination because we need people with many different uh, areas of expertise. So um, for understanding the astrophysics, we, uh, we have you know, a preparation in physics and uh, astrophysics, astronomy, um, and mathematics are important. Um, uh, and for the general uh, approach of you know, doing scientific research, really a wide variety of experience is possible for that. Uh, engineering preparation is good for uh, building and operating detectors, um, uh, the uh, technical experience you can gain from research is good for uh, both understanding the data, you know, making sure that the data is high quality, as well as uh, carrying out the analysis of the data to, to look for particular signals in the data. So it really um, can make use of students and um, uh, really can make use of students with a, a wide range of uh, preparation and experience. So um, we are right now, of course, here in India for the uh, multi-messenger astronomy in the era of LIGO India conference. Mm -hmm. um, you have been to India a few times before, Yes, right? I have. Um, so how, how have your experiences been like and what do you think of this uh, fantastic <laughs> venue which is, we have for this conference? It's really a gorgeous location and, and the sun is out now and it's uh, really lovely here. It's, uh, uh, I have been past this area a few times, but mostly at night. And, uh, uh, but uh, uh, it's been uh, great to see the, the terrain in the day and so on. Um, I think uh, what I've seen from my trips to India and I've um, over um, from some conferences that I came to, um, and also from this one here, is a growing um, involvement and uh, in the gravitational wave astronomy as, a, as an area of astronomy to be combined with others. And so uh, from my first uh, visits to India and my first um, work with Indian colleagues, the, the focus at that time was on how to analyze the gravitational wave data. And I've mm -hmm. seen that expanded now um, to how can we use the gravitational wave data together with astronomy observations to understand astrophysics. Um, so it's really been this evolution uh, of scientific, a broadening scientific uh, interest and a broadening um, involvement of institutes and uh, people, you know, students and, and uh, more experienced researchers uh, in India, some of whom have come from other areas of, of research and others who are um, getting their training and uh, uh, in the area of gravitational wave astronomy and uh, you know, starting to populate the, the community here in India. So it's really uh, becoming an important uh, component of the global effort, a very significant uh, part of the global effort. So um, while gravitational wave research and all the physics and astrophysics we are gaining from it, uh, learning from it is definitely very exciting. Uh, but one question that uh, is, of course, very important is what does society gain from it? Why should humanity as a whole spend time on the uh, time and resources on um, studying gravitational waves? 
Well, I think astronomy is one of, one of the wonderful pursuits that humans can, can pursue. Um, we all see the sky uh, and we see the stars that are nearby. And what we've done over the, the years um, is to develop instruments that allow us to see farther away. Telescopes um, show us the stars and the galaxies uh, further away. And other instruments tell us about the emissions in um, types of waves that we didn't, uh, that we don't see with our eyes in X-rays, in radio, um, in gamma rays, and now with gravitational waves. Putting this all together is putting together the pieces of a big puzzle about how the cosmos works, how stars are born, how they evolve, how they die, and how this affects the structure of the universe as a whole. Why are stars collected in galaxies? And why are the galaxies distributed the way they are? And how is the universe expanding um, as we um, as we go forward in time. So these are all big questions that I think we can all appreciate and enjoy thinking about um, as a species. Uh, so this is a worldwide pursuit that um, allows uh, people from all countries to talk about a common um, topic of, of interest to all of us and something that we can all appreciate that goes beyond you know, nationality, beyond politics, um, but is still crucially important to all of us for our place in the universe. So you're saying that um, this research of understanding the fundamental driving truths of our universe will help us to transcend all our other differences and really is, is the absolute pursuit that uh, humanity could have. Well, I certainly hope so. And it can be part of that. It, it gives us, um, it gives the scientists and people who are, who learn about these topics, you know, um, something to talk about. So, so you and I, you know, met through this, uh, through this uh, scientific area, even though we come from, from different paths and have different scientific backgrounds as well as different, uh, you know, cultural origins and so on. But uh, it's something that we can share and that we can share with other people too. This is actually one thing that I think is really exciting about uh, gravitational waves, um, that with the detection of black holes um, in using gravitational wave observations, these very mysterious objects that by definition don't emit light are now something that we can understand a little more directly because of the gravitational waves that were emitted from them. And um, with the binary neutron star, um, uh, neutron stars are also pretty exotic, but we've now connected those neutron stars merging with the production of light, something that we could actually see with our eyes if we were looking in the right direction and had, had sharp enough eyes. Um, so these are all important ways that we can um, share the, the wonder of astronomy. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. It was great talking to you and um, we all look forward to more of your visits and continued interactions, not just with uh, researchers, but hopefully also with students. Very Thanks much. a lot. Thank you so much.